Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Leading Disruption, Thriving in the Perma Crisis. My name is Michelle Eisenberg, and I am a program assistant at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. And for those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit that's building a better path for entrepreneurs worldwide by improving inclusion, access, and knowledge in entrepreneurship. So as you will see in the chat in a moment, the NASDAQ Center provides programs, resources, and exceptional mentorship to entrepreneurs across all races, industries, and geographies. So definitely make sure to check out those links and resources that are going to be posted in the chat. And then just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. First, let us know where you're dialing in from in the chat. And second, we're going to open up for live Q&A at the end of the event, so please make sure to submit your questions for us in the Q&A function that's at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation, and we will try our best to get to all of them. All right. Thank you all for joining us today. And of course, none of what we do could be possible at the center without all of the amazing support from our sponsors, including NASDAQ. Lehigh University, Bank of the West, Airbnb, KPMG, Wilson Sensini, Woodruff Sawyer, Microsoft Entrepreneurship for Positive Impact, BPM, and HubSpot for Startups. We are humbled by their contributions and hope you are grateful too. And so before we get started, I'm just going to launch a couple polls to See how everyone's doing today. Awesome. California, Texas, Canada. Welcome, everyone. All right. So this first poll is going to ask, how are you feeling? Fearful, anxious, surviving, or optimistic? Give everyone a few moments to submit their answers here. Thank you for participating. Going to go ahead and end this poll, share the results. Looks like optimism's in the lead. Always great to see, but we do have some feelings of anxiety. Hopefully some of what we talk about today will address those feelings. All right, I'm going to stop sharing that poll and launch the second one. What is keeping you up at night? This one is going to tell us a little bit more about your current entrepreneurial needs. I'll give everyone a few moments to think about it, submit their answers. Awesome. All right, I'm going to end this poll, share these results. All right, I think, oh yeah, surviving is, is kind of ahead of finance, but it's close behind sales coming up after that. Um, so I'm sure our conversation today um, will help uh, begin to address some of these feelings. All right, and we will take this into account for the development of our future programming. So I stopped sharing that poll and without any further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our special guest, Charlene Lee. She is Chief Research Officer at PA Consulting. Charlene, thank you so much for joining us and I'm gonna hand the floor to you. Okay, thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you everyone for joining today. I'm excited to be talking about uh, uh, about leading in disruption. And as people have been sharing, while you're very optimistic, it's also a really tough time. And it's I'm gonna be sharing some research today about uh, leading and thriving in the perma crisis. And I'll explain that in, in just a second. Uh, and I just want to give a little bit of background about myself too, as well. I have also been an entrepreneur, started my own company in 2008, sold it in 2015. So my heart really goes out to all of you and just uh, thinking about the entrepreneurial journey. So I hope that the words that I share with you today will be helpful uh, and, and supportive in, in your journey going forward. Uh, just so you know, I do have a lot of resources available. You can get these slides and many other resources at my site, charlinglee.com slash NASDAQ-23. All right, so let's get into it. Uh, so we think about disruption, and I feel like I've been on this journey to change the idea of disruption as being a negative force to being something that is very different. And that instead of thinking of disruption as something to avoid, we should be thinking about disruption as an opportunity for change. 
And anytime things are going wrong, things are being upset, the status quo is being reset, you can either go and hide in a corner and hope that you can avoid being hit by that disruption, just kind of hold steady, be resilient in the face of disruption, and hope that it passes by as quickly as possible. Or you can step out into the storm and say, well, everyone's being disrupted by this. So where are the opportunities? Because while some things are no longer the same, new things are coming up, new opportunities. So how do I serve those people? How do I be of service? How do I help people? And there are opportunities to be gained from them. And that's all the more so today. Uh, the perma crisis is something that came um, out of a, a word of the year from the Collins Dictionary. And they describe it as an extended period of instability, insecurity, especially when resulting from a series of catastrophic events. Uh, let's name a few of them. There's COVID, there's the supply chain, the um, crisis that we went through afterwards. Uh, we have the economic turmoil, up and down, inflation, potential recession. You could argue that we're already in a recession. Uh, we have war in Europe. We have the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, and it's so many things. It's just like crisis after crisis after crisis. And I don't know if you saw the headlines, but there's this giant kelp island about to slam into the Gulf Coast. So it's like these things that are completely unpredictable, out of our control. And it just feels like it's never going to end. And it feels like there's, there's not only just constant, they're really complex. Uh, if you have any operations in Europe, uh, Ukraine or Russia, you understand just how complex it is. You can't just withdraw people. You, you have to like figure out how to serve your employees, your customers who are being impacted by the war. So there's a lot of change happening. And the research I'm going to go through with you today is to think about how your leadership needs to change. How do you navigate around all of these changes? One leader was saying to me, we used to say, you know, there's a crisis here. We deal with everything we have to do as soon as this crisis is over. And she shared, it never is over. So how do we actually balance this? How do we move from a world where we're just surviving, and a lot of you are feeling like you're just surviving now, to thriving in this space? So I'm going to talk about four areas today around leading in a perma crisis. First of all, how leading yourself is different, how leading teams, leading your organization, and then finally leading externally. And these are all different aspects of leadership today. So we'll look at each of these dimensions in turn. Let's look at leading self, first of all, in the perma crisis. And the, the key characteristics here is that it is incredibly complex now. In the past, as a leader, you, you probably got into that leadership position because you're really good at what you do. You know how to do things. You know how to look at a situation and come up with a solution. You have the answers. People come to you for that. And yet in this day and time, it's so complex and it's happening so much. We don't have the answers anymore. And that can be really disconcerting as a leader. And so one of the first areas is to move from needing to have all the answers to being able to ask questions, ask great questions that can focus everybody on the problem, on the job, because there's so many crises happening at you, what do we prioritize? How do we focus on the right thing first? And so by asking questions, you're actually focusing people on the job to be done. What is the most important thing? And the reality is you probably can't figure out the answer yourself because it's too complex. Things are moving too fast. So you need everyone to be leaders themselves and to contribute to thinking about what the solution is to a very clear problem. And your questioning sets up what the problem is. Now, this is only one aspect of changing your leadership. One of the biggest issues I hear from leaders is that they feel like they're no longer in control. And so the second thing I would recommend is that you give up the need to be in control because the reality is you probably weren't in control in the first place. We just live in this illusion of being in control because we could see people in the office. We knew what was happening. We had the answers. But now in the perma crisis, the reality is you're faced with that day to day. You're not in control of the situation. 
And so how do we get comfortable with this? It's when you give up that need to be in control. And what you turn into instead is to know that to be in command means that you have this really strong relationship with people so that you can go and actually pull people together. And we'll talk about that in the next section. And then the other area I would encourage you to think about is how do we sit in this uncomfortable space, which I call the messy middle? Because before, when you're starting out, this is the status quo here, and you know you have to leave it or it's forced from you because of a crisis, and you know you're going to get to some point in the future. And the place in between here is what I call the messy middle. And most leaders try to get through that messy middle as fast as possible. You're saying to your organization, come on, everyone, hurry up, get to this point, get to the future already, right? Don't dolly and, and lag behind. You have to go through this as quickly as possible. But think about that space in the middle as something very unique and different. It's actually a fantastic time to look at things from a different perspective, to be creative, to look at for, for the opportunities that you may not have seen before because you were anchored in the past. And because you haven't quite arrived at the future yet, you're free. You're free to experience and see things from a different perspective. And so take advantage of this time in the messy middle. Provide the structure for yourself and for your team to be strong and united in this messy middle so you can go through it with confidence. And part of that confidence comes from having a really healthy relationship with failure. How do we think about failure? Is it something we avoid? Is it something that we embrace? I, and one of the biggest problems with this is that we act as if every single decision is going to be permanent. When in reality, most decisions, 99% of decisions are reversible. And yet we do the other thing. We, we put everything possible into making sure it's the right decision. And that slows us down. It, it keeps us from being able to take a stand quickly to see if it's the right direction. If it's not, then we can pivot and come right back. We know this is the reality, but yet so much of our personality, of our ego, of our presence is tied into making really good decisions all the time, 100% of the time. And when you can let that go, embrace the fact that this journey is going to require us to make lots of decisions that may not work out then you can embrace the fact that you have a really healthy relationship with things not working out. I talked to one leader and I asked him what his relationship with failure was. And he goes, we decided not to fail anymore as an organization. And I'm like, okay, this would be an interesting story. How do you never fail again? And he said, we tried, we tried everything to have a healthy relationship with failure. We talked about celebrating failure. We talked about failing fast and failing smart. And it just still felt awful. So we decided to just ban the word failure from our vocabulary. We changed our mindset to say, we're not failing anymore. We're learning. So if this is our goal and we don't quite meet it, then wow, we have a lot of data now. We, these are the things that worked. These are the things that didn't work. We're learning. And now we know what the gap is that we have to fill to get to the point we want to be. They just stopped and just stopped thinking about this whole idea of failure. They had a really healthy relationship with failure in a way that they could actually move forward. And in the end, what you're trying to develop in yourself is confidence. Confidence that you can thrive with any crisis that comes your way, no matter how complex, no matter how big. And confidence isn't that you're going to be successful. Confidence is knowing that no matter what the outcome, you're going to be okay. And just think back to three years ago, when we shut our doors to the world, we had to completely change everything in our lives to do with COVID. And we, we had no idea what was going to happen. We had no idea how long. If we had known, we probably would have freaked out. But in the end, we came out on the other side, for the most part, pretty okay. In some cases, we learned how to not just survive, but also to thrive. And that should give you confidence that no matter what happens, you're going to be okay. It's going to be hard. It's going to be really tough, but we're going to be okay in the end. So some actions for thinking about leading yourself. First of all, think about places and times when asking questions instead of having all the answers is going to serve you and your team really well. And one suggestion is the more complex, 
the more volatile, the more urgent, the bigger the crisis, the more you need to listen and the more you need to be asking those questions instead of trying to answer everything. The second thing I would say is examine all the places where you feel the need to have control and really dig down and say, do you really need to have control? And were you ever truly in control in the first place? Because when you can look at that truth, you can approach your leadership in a very different way. You find yourself letting go this grasping of control instead of saying, like, how, how do I make this all work? How do I control it? When you realize you can't control it, you'll look at the problem and find different solutions. And then finally, I would encourage you to practice mindfulness. And this is not about going away and meditating for hours on end. Mindfulness is being able to look at your situation with reality, be present. It could be as simple as taking a deep breath before you get onto a Zoom call, before you walk into the room with people. Take a deep breath and figure out, okay, what am I trying to accomplish here? Be present to the people who are in the room. Ask them to be present to each other and be really focused on what everyone is bringing in at that particular moment. Because when we're distracted by all the crises that are happening, it's really difficult to be present and to be honest about what is happening. And unless you be honest and, uh, and, um, and truthful about what's really happening around you, you have no chance of being able to make good decisions. So that's about leading yourself. Let's talk about leading teams. And if you think of what leadership is, leadership is simply a relationship. It's a relationship between people who aspire to create change. That would be you, the entrepreneur, and people who are inspired to follow them. And that's all the people who you're working with, your employees, your fellow founders, your investors, your customers. They choose to follow you. And that's a relationship that you have to think about and manage. And so when you think about managing teams and leading teams, think about what kind of relationship you want with them. And we've been doing this study now for, for quite a while. And we just, I'll show you some of the research we've seen. The type of relationship that people want with their employers really depends on how they define what is fulfilling and motivating for them in their jobs. Because everybody has different motivations, have different attitudes. And this can shift over time as well. And so what we did is we surveyed over 9,000 employees from all around the world. And we found that there were three different segments, passives, engaged, and also power holders. And the power holders are a really interesting group. They're only 14% of all the respondents, but they are very autonomous, they're career-driven. They are more than just engaged in the purpose and mission of the company. They see the company as a place where it can make so many differences. They're looking beyond just their jobs and their roles to say, how are we impacting customers? How are we thinking about our suppliers? So looking at uh, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion issues, or looking at sustainability. They're calling the company into account to reach a higher level of performance and excellence that they believe is possible. And passives are, you know, they, they just want to come to work, get their paycheck and go home. They work 95, the vast majority of people engaged are a really unique engaged group. But these power holders are key because if you want to navigate and lead through the perma crisis, tapping into your power holders is going to be so important because you can leverage them to do so much more. And what's interesting is they over-index in middle management. This is the place where usually good ideas go to die. We call it the frozen middle, the permafrost, whatever you call that middle management, people at the very top are bought into the change. People at the bottom, the front lines are bought into the change and the middle management is sitting there going, that's not how we do things here. So actually finding the power holders in your middle management lakes can have an exponential effect in creating change. So just to give you an idea of how much more engaged power holders are, they're much more likely to be thinking about working with suppliers and on sustainability, uh, recognizing their peers outside of their immediate reporting um, areas for good work. Uh, they build positive relationships with suppliers. It goes on and on. They're thinking about customers, their fellow employees and suppliers at levels much higher than people who are engaged or, or passive. And similarly, we can see the data that they're much more likely to proactively suggest ideas to create an inclusive culture. 
they're talking, they're taking sustainability best practices and bringing them into the business. So they're being proactive in multiple areas, especially around culture, DEI, sustainability. And these are the people you need to have because they go not even just engaged in the business, they go above and beyond and they're bringing great ideas. And so what do you do with them? What kind of relationship do you foster with them? Do you see them as disruptors who, in a negative way, where they are to be shut down, put out because they're not quote team players? Or do you see them as, wow, they have this energy. How do we harness it? How do we give them the strong sense of agency and release that energy to be able to address these pressing issues? So when it comes to leading teams in the perma crisis, the first thing is to define the kind of relationship we want, because the relationship you have with power holders is going to be very different than the ones that you have with the engaged or the passive employee. And then have a plan, a strategic plan to identify who your power holders are, engage them, leverage them against all of these pressing issues that you have. You probably know who these people are already. They're sometimes labeled the troublemakers. But if your organization is in an enlightened way thinking about how to engage its employees, then you think of them as advocates, as activists in a really positive way because they're seeing disruption, creating opportunities for change. All right, let's now talk about a higher level of leadership, which is leading your organization. And it's a challenge because you're looking at all these short-term crises and issues, and you still have these long-term goals and strategies and purpose. And I put a crocodile in here because the analogy someone told me is like in a perma crisis, you're canoeing and then you find yourself completely surrounded by all these crocodiles who are attacking your canoe, trying to jump in the canoe with you. And you're taking your one tool, your paddle and whacking all the crocodiles to keep them from jumping your canoe. And probably the best thing you could do is to take that paddle and paddle out of that crocodile infested swamp as fast as you can. So how do you use the tools, the assets, the people, the resources available in your organization to keep that long-term view, that high strategic intention, to keep your purpose at the center of everything that you do so that you can navigate these crises in the context of what you're trying to accomplish in the long-term? It is incredibly difficult to do. We all struggle with this. And I'll give you the, one of my favorite quotes um, from Wayne Gretzky in hockey. And you know this quote. He said, everyone skates to where the puck is. I will skate to where the puck will be. And he did this by training himself to look at, uh, the, at hockey games. He would watch them on TV as a child. And he would have a piece, a pad of paper in his lap. And he'd be tracing out a, link, a, a rink and then tracing all the paths of the puck and where the players were for different plays. And he would memorize these plays and then try them out on the ice. And he just did this over and over again. So granted, he just had some tremendous talent, but he also practiced literally seeing where the future would be. And that is what disruptive organizations and really good leaders do in the, in the context of disruption and all this perma crisis is that they're able to focus on the future. They can literally see what the future looks like because they do this all the time. They're not focused on business as usual. They are keeping aware of what's happening over here on a day-to-day -day basis, but they also have this long-term vision of where they want to go. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, this is company Adobe, which you all know is a large technology firm. And one of the things Adobe did back in 2010, 2011 was they looked at their core business which was selling software on CD-ROMs. And so it came in a package, sat on a shelf, you would buy them and own that software forever. But they could see on the horizon that cloud was coming, that cloud computing, cloud software was going to be huge. And so they thought maybe we should go into this space and transform our organization to take advantage and be more flexible and nimble to meet the needs of our customers. They had a couple of problems though and barriers to this. First of all, their customers who bought these CD-ROMs were perfectly happy. They paid thousands of dollars upfront to own that software in perpetuity. And they didn't want to have this idea that I had to pay every month to Adobe some fee to use the software. And even if it was updated, they were perfectly happy with the software. The second thing is everything in the business would have to change if they moved to the cloud. 
uh, the way they developed the product, instead of 18 to 24 month cycles, it would be constant releases. The way they marketed, the way they sold, not through channel anymore, the way even they did finance and the way they accounted for the business was going to have to change. And the third thing is that as a publicly traded company, they knew that this transition would take two years to financially work it out. They knew that they would lose money for eight straight quarters. Imagine going to Wall Street and saying, we lost a ton of money. What happens to your stock price at those times? It goes down. And they were concerned that if their stock price went down too much, they could be the target of a hostile takeover. So let me show you what actually happened. They decided to go forward. They did tons of research, lots of modeling, a lot of client and customer interviews and said, this is a huge opportunity for us to open up a market that just wasn't in a position to, again, pay thousands of dollars up front, but could pay $10 a month for Photoshop. And so the numbers look like this. This is all indexed to Q4 2011 when they announced this. And you can see the revenue stay pretty much the same, but in Q4 2012 and into Q1 2013, they started moving into the cloud in a very concerted fashion. That's when they launched their first product. And you can see their net income took a huge hit. And yet at the same time, the stock price went up. This is literally what the CEO and the CFO did. They went to Wall Street and said, at the end of Q1 2013, said, we have great news. Our strategy is on track. We are so excited to tell you that we lost a ton of money. Isn't this fantastic? It, I mean, who goes to Wall Street and say, we lost a ton of money and happy about it? Well, a company that knows exactly where they're heading towards. They knew what the disruption was going to look like. They prepared themselves, their organization, and their investors and customers to know what it would look like. They knew that they were going to lose money, and they hit their numbers going down. And you can see as they lost more money, their stock price kept going up because it was validation that their strategy was working. That's confidence in a nutshell, to say that even we didn't, even though they didn't know exactly how it would turn out, they knew that in the end they would be okay because they had done so much work in preparation for this disruption. And as somebody who was an analyst following Adobe at the time, I could tell you it was really hard. It was very, very disruptive for the organization, almost uh, traumatic in some ways because the amount of change that they had to go through in a very short amount of time. So as you're thinking about the pivots you have to make, the choices you have to make in leading your organization for the long term, ask yourself if every single person in your organization can answer these three questions. The first is, do you know who your future customer is? If I were to come into your organization and just pick a random employee and ask, who is your future customer? Could they tell me? Could they answer the second question then is, what's your strategy to be able to meet their needs? A strategy is simply, we're going from where we are here today to where we want to be in the future. And this is the roadmap we're going to follow. We're going to do these things and not do these other things in order to meet the future needs. Can your employees tell me what that strategy looks like? And the third important question is, can they tell me what is their specific role? What is their contribution to making that strategy a success? This is what alignment looks like. Alignment isn't everyone in a room nodding yes, yes, we agree to this strategy and then going off and doing their own thing. It's truly deep alignment up and down throughout the organization to be able to answer these three questions. And that's what leading in a perma crisis requires, is that is everyone clear on where we are heading? So that when a crisis comes along, you can actually know how to think about that crisis in the context of your long-term strategy, in the context of the customers you want to serve in the future in the context of how I do my job every day. Another tool I found very helpful, this is a large financial services organization, and they mapped out their transformation roadmap in six quarters over the next 18 months. So they knew where they wanted to go strategically, but they also knew from an execution point of view in great detail, every single quarter what was going to happen. And what was amazing is that the details in Q6 were as detailed as Q1. And so you can look at through the stage, everyone would know when parts were happening and everyone knew what was going to be delivered at the end of Q1. 
And if it wasn't delivered, then everyone could see that you didn't, you weren't able to come up with something or they could um, help halfway through the quarter. It's like, okay, we're falling behind. I'm going to need help and support in order to make that deadline to hit that goal. That level of transparency really creates a sense of accountability. And what was beautiful about this program in particular is that at the end of the quarter, everybody took an accounting of where we were and understood where people were ahead, behind, and they then adjusted the rest of the quarters and then added another quarter. It was an 18th month rolling execution and budget. They would expand and contract, reshift, and prioritize different pieces of the budget based on where they were at the end of each quarter. This is a highly adaptive, agile strategy. Again, not to say that they're changing their strategy every quarter, but they're updating the execution plan based on all the things that are happening around them. And this is such an incredible tool when it comes to leading in the primer crisis, because it's acknowledgement that things change. Things can change in a quarter. And we, ha we have all experienced what that looks like over the past few years. So you want to build that flexibility into your actual leadership tools for your organization. So leading some actions you can take, carve out time. This is the most important thing you can be doing. Carve out time in your calendar, preserve it like it is everything. And it absolutely is where you can focus on those long-term important non-urgent issues. Because if you don't, your calendar will just be filled with all of those crises, urgent things that are incredibly important to do. But if you don't take that time to preserve that, and especially if you're the top person in the organization, if you're the entrepreneur, you're the founder, if you don't do this, who else is going to do it? So I mean, you must set aside that time. Uh, really focus on your future customers. I, I talk about this in my latest book, The Disruption Mindset, that the secret ingredient to disruptive organizations is that they have a really clear idea of who their future customers are and how they're going to meet their needs. Again, they may not be always developing in the exact way, but as they move into that future, they're taking steps, they're learning, learning more, and they're able to refine that vision of who that future customer is. But they start with a really clear idea of who the future customer is that they want to serve. And then really think about aligning your entire organization with these tools, with those three questions, with the six quarter walk around the particular future you want to build. And as problems come up, as obstacles come on, then think about all the ingenious ways because people are already aligned on where you want to go. They come up with the solutions that are actually in keeping, in support of where you want to go. You don't have the crazy ideas coming from people, but yet you're able to tap into the wisdom of crowds, the wisdom of your organization, because people bring all these different perspectives, but now it's an informed perspective about what that strategy needs to be. And then finally, there's no substitute to excellence. And I want to draw a distinction between excellence and perfection. Oftentimes, we strive for being perfect, and that's very different from being excellent. Knowing what the difference is and being able to define that for your organization is extremely important. Because if you want to pull off all of these things in the context of a primer crisis, you're going to have to operate at such a high level of excellence. There's no room for people to be saying, well, it's an okay job. Because if you do that, you're going to be constantly trying to make up for the fact that you didn't do an excellent job. And while you're doing that, another crisis comes along. So do the foundational work, move beyond just the basics and hygiene to really aim for exceptional, excellent work in your operations. All right. Home stretch here. Let's talk about leading externally. There were some issues being brought up by the primer crisis that just can't be addressed by a single organization. I, and these are uh, things like sustainability, our issues around society, uh, in inequity in our organizations, and, in, and also in our societies, again, pay inequities, so many different issues that go beyond just what's going on inside our four walls of our business. And at the same time, there are lots of opportunities that are being created by these disruptions, by the crisis that can't be pursued by only one player. You have to go and pursue multiple people. 
let's see, my sharing has stopped for some reason. Let me go back to it. Um, let me go back. I'm going to stop the share. Try again. Sorry about this. You got to love technology. Okay. Hopefully that's back. Great. Yep. Looks All right. Great. Good. Thank you for that confirmation. All right. So let's take a look at one example. Oh, and also people are expecting us as leaders to take a stand on various issues. So this is really about thinking about all the different stakeholders you have in business. You have your investors, of course, you have your employees, you have the customers, you have your suppliers, you have uh, your, uh, the, the, your communities that you're operating, you have society, you have the environment, you have regulators. I mean, it goes on and on the list. Balancing all of those things is nearly impossible because you can't really balance it. It's about understanding where the priorities are. Where are you going to act? which are the most important stakeholders to be listening to to create value for. So I'll give you an example. In the UK, uh, the construction industry has been very focused on the well-being and the safety of its employees. You can imagine it's all about zero incidents of safety. So we want people to stay safe because people will die. People get really hurt on work sites. So there's been focus on physical safety and they realize that the mental health of their employees was also suffering, especially during COVID. And so what they realized was that construction industry workers were three times as likely to take their own lives than in other sectors. And also men between the ages of 40 and 50 were six times as likely to commit suicide. So this, they saw this as a business risk. And the CEOs across the industry started working together and collaborating and saying, we've got to be able to support an entire industry. It, it's not something that we can do only in our workplace. So some of the things they did was have contracts with the subcontract saying, you, you need to provide mental health support for your employees. And if you don't have that, then we will supply that. We'll support you with that with on the work site for your employees, our subcontractors, and our employees. And you can see this quote from Mark Reynolds, uh, the Mace Group, uh, the chair and CEO of Mace Group, talking about how we need to be thinking about this as an industry to address this issue. So one of the most interesting and innovative ideas that they had is they uh, stood up a nonprofit of, of social workers who were also barbers, and they would come on site and cut people's hairs during their break. And in the, when the 20, 30 minutes where they're getting a haircut, they would talk about whatever issues were going on and encourage them to go and follow up with the mental health resources. And over time, only less than half of the, the people, employees inside the industry felt comfortable talking about mental health issues and is now close to 90%. So some significant changes on a significant issue that's being addressed as an industry. But organizations can also do this. I'll give an example of RICO. Uh, one of the things they did is they looked at the 17 United Nations Sustainability Development Goals and said, which of these are most material to our business to become, to be a sustainable business? And they identified seven key topics in two areas around resolving social issues through business and also robust management of the infrastructure to make sure that these were aligned against those 17 Sustainability Development Goals. They had clear metrics. And these are things that the top executives in the organization are being held accountable for and making sure that these things are actually happening. And they report it every single quarter in their annual report. Their CEO is adamant about this and is constantly working internally and also externally with different partners to make sure that we think about different ways to approach each of these issues. Because as you can see, issues like the circular economy or zero-based carbon society, open innovation, can't be addressed only within the business. And then in terms of expectations of our leaders, now we're seeing that consumers, our customers, our employees are expecting that leaders speak out. And this is from the Edelman Trust Barometer. And you can see that different topics, anything from climate change to workforce reskilling are topics that leaders need to be able to feel comfortable talking about. Even if you're not at the very top of the organization, but especially as founders in thinking and in entrepreneurs, how are you thinking about these issues? What are your thoughts about that? To be clear what your point of view is and to be able to feel comfortable and confident in expressing that is a key part of leading externally as well as internally. So a few actions to think about. Look at the most material areas of your business. 
to prioritize external collaborations, what really matters? Because if it matters to the business, it's going to matter also externally. So finding these win-wins um, can really help you identify the places you want to be. Think about your stakeholders. I rattled them off very quickly at the beginning, but think about which stakeholders would be, are them, again, going, going to be impacted materially, but also which of the stakeholders are going to be good collaborators, good partners with you in leading externally. And then finally, clarify when you're going to be speaking up. And to that point, the last point I want to make is this is really difficult to do. Leading in any circumstance, but leading in disruption, leading in a perma crisis requires that you leave your comfort zone and you know you're doing it right. If you feel your palms are a little sweaty and your stomach is churning a little bit because you should be uncomfortable. This is really difficult work. It's not work that most people will take on. But if you find, you can find that strength, that courage to step out of your comfort zone, you'll be rewarded with a lot of opportunities and potential to be able to create some really amazing work with the people around you. So we can open up for questions now. I just want to give you my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I put my information up here all the time because I want people to come out and, and tell me what's working, what's not. That's how I do my research. And again, you can get the slides and more information at my website, charlinelee.com slash NASDAQ-23. Charlene, thank you so much. That was amazing and just such a great little dose of optimism and actionable insight um, for these trying times. So much appreciated. Um, and let's just kind of dive into the, the question and answer. So um, I have a ton of questions for you. First, um, you talked about giving up the need to be in control. And I think for a lot of people, that's kind of like deeply ingrained in the way they move through life, like both professionally and personally. So do you have any like actionable steps that you've used or that you've kind of seen other people have success with that would help them kind of work towards letting go of that need to be in control? Yeah. I, again, I, I think about this definition of leadership being a relationship mm -hmm. and you think about the relationships in your lives that really matter to you, your family, mm -hmm. your spouse or partner, your kids. Do you control those relationships? Right. Right. And you realize immediately, like, oh, I, I don't dare. <laughs> I was just, uh, right. <laughs> I can't even begin. And so how do you foster, how do you um, exercise power in those relationships? I mean, you think about leadership as a relationship. Mm -hmm. You think about power in a very, very different way. Right. You think about accumulating and using power in a different way. And so this is about influence. It's about, and again, commanding sounds like I'm going to tell you what to do. No, command says, when I ask you to do something, you will say yes. Right. That's a relationship that's you formed. Mm -hmm. That's true command. You don't, and do they do it out of fear or do they do it out of excitement? Right. Do they do it out of anxiety? And, and so the difference between excitement and anxiety in that relationship is this confidence mm -hmm. that, yeah, I, I believe in you. I'm confident in what your leadership is saying. So I'm going to follow you into the heat of this crisis. Right. So I love that. Yeah. It, like Every really time you feel you're tightening up and you're feeling you need to be in control, really, really ask yourself, what are you truly controlling? And in the end, the only thing you can control is yourself. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. How you react to anything, mm -hmm. how you move into a situation. That's the only thing you can control. That's amazing because it really taps into like what actually motivates us as human beings. Um, it's not that fear, it's that excitement. Um, and so, and kind of, you know, thinking about it for yourself, like what motivates yourself? Like, is it, is it, is it things that excite you or is it things that make you afraid? Um, and I think for most people that answer, they, they, that answer might come to them kind of quickly. Um, and that should be very informative for them. So that that's just great. Um, I think something else a lot of people might be able to relate to is kind of that period after a perceived failure when it feels like those negative thoughts are kind of piling on top of each other. So what are some ways that you can pull yourself out of that thinking trap to kind of make the necessary choices to keep your business going? 
Yeah, again, I think the most important time for to encourage people to come forward is the minute they realize something isn't working out, because yeah. then you actually have a chance because people are coming forward and comfortable, feel safe right. coming forward of supporting them, of making it right. And mm-hmm. it's not seen as a failing on their part that they mm-hmm. couldn't do it. It's them admitting like, I can't figure this out on my own. I need your all's help. Right. And when you're like, thank you. Thank you for asking me for my support. And if you think about it as not asking for help, but asking for support, I'm giving support. I'm not helping you. I'm not treating you as somebody who is weak and incompetent. Mm -hmm. In fact, you're incredibly competent, but this is a huge problem that nobody could solve on their own. Yeah. There's no shame. You're removing that shame. And by saying to people, all I ask is that you do your best. And sometimes your best isn't enough. And so we need to put all of our best into the situation. And then sometimes you may have done all of our best and it just didn't work out. Well, now we know. Now we know it didn't work. And we're better off than where we were before. Uh, Google did a really interesting thing. They do this constantly. Is that when they close down a project and they're constantly closing on projects, uh, they would take the engineers and put them on the hottest projects. And it was a really explicit point that the project failed, not you engineers. Mm. The project didn't work out. You did your best. You know, we tried, we, we aimed for the moon. We fell a little bit short, but my gosh, we learned so much more. And those engineers are told, take your learnings and bring this to this really important project so that we can make sure this project succeeds. Right. So that's how you can think about failure. Amazing. And I, I think that that shame is really kind of like the root of what makes it so difficult So I love that you pointed that out because that's something that people can kind of look to and be like, these are feelings of shame. Like these, you know, this isn't what's going to get me to where I need to go. And this isn't what's going to get my team to where they need to go. Yeah. Yeah, Shame is a really big underlying driver for many of the things that we do. We feel shame because we didn't show up in the way we wanted to. We feel shame because we yelled or raised our voice. We feel shame because we didn't do as much as we could because we were home taking care of ourselves because we had COVID or something. So the minute we can let go of that shame and we as leaders can allow people to bring their whole human selves to work and be seen for being human, there's no shame in that. Mm -hmm. We just remove it. And we talk about psychological safety. And and basically it is, can I feel no shame? Mm -hmm. Can I just not feel any shame about any of the things that I do? Not feel judged. Feel safe in that way. This to me feels very connected to kind of like your concept of like employee alignment. Um, And I loved that kind of framework you laid out of asking your employees those three questions to help measure that in a way. So what can founders do to kind of gather that information in a way that communicates to their employees that, that feeling of support rather than pressure coming from management? I, I think again, just uh, it, it sounds so simple, but taking the time to yeah. understand where they're coming from, we mm-hmm. we find that this idea of passive, engaged, and uh, power holders is a really simple, easy framework. But respect the fact that they want to be passives, right? You know, why does everyone have to be engaged? Sure. Realize that that could change over time in the context. It could move from one team to the next and suddenly become a power holder who in the past were a passive. Mm-hmm. It could be just a time in their lives. They're busy with things at home. They just want to go work and do their best there, be right. excellent in their job and respect that. Other people like, hey, I want to be in the middle of the mess, mm-hmm. right? And so I think, again, understanding where you're coming from, truly seeing me as a person, uh, that I don't have to hide the fact that I am dealing with whatever it is in my life and all aspects of it, uh, mm-hmm. make goes for, goes a long way in building yeah. that trust and building that relationship. So again, this is about investing in a relationship, investing. We think about as investing in relationship is actually investing in power. Right. You're investing in the power of your people to come forward. You're investing in your power to be able to ask them for things. They can also ask things of you. Mm-hmm. And you have to deliver. I love it. that. 
That's amazing. Um, I, I just love your investing in the power of your people to, you know, move forward. That's just so powerful. And I think it's such a great perspective on like that idea of power that I think isn't so e naturally thought about when it comes to leadership. Like you wouldn't, I think most people wouldn't automatically kind of like connect that concept of power to what they picture as power in leadership. So I think it's just so amazing for you to have pointed that out. Um, so I want to touch on the power holders um, and kind of, you talked about finding these power holders in your middle management ranks. So, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs uh, that are kind of just beginning to think about expanding their team beyond themselves, what are some ways that they might source power holders from the workplace, uh, sorry, from the workforce, um, kind of while maintaining that strong sense of their established values and purpose? Yeah, those established values and purpose are front and center in everything that you do. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times entrepreneurs start with that and then kind of drop it. They're so busy. They get focused on um, market, uh, product market fit, um, thinking mm -hmm. about how do I scale? Uh, what is my minimally viable product and everything? And they lose sight of the culture and the values. That has to be at the center of everything that you do. Purpose-driven organizations mm -hmm. are thinking about their purpose statement. They're thinking about their values. They're thinking about the stakeholders that that reflects out into everybody. They're thinking about their future customers. They're thinking about all these things in the context of their purpose and their values and their mission. And you can never lose sight of it. Yeah. Everything that you do has to be driven by purpose. Mm -hmm. And and I know that in my organization, we're we're a large 4,000 person company and we are incredibly purpose driven. Mm -hmm. We talk about it in almost every single meeting and I'm in meetings all day long. Right. And it's built into our organization and thinking, because our, our purpose is to use the power of ingenuity to build a positive human future. So in our bids, we actually talk about what's the positive human future we're doing with this consulting project. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's built into everything. Yeah. And if it's not, then you start losing sight. You start losing that purpose, that uniting, that alignment that you have. Mm -hmm. So look for people who understand that and then drill it into them. Ask them how has purpose driven their work, their lives? Mm, yeah. What's their personal purpose? Mm -hmm. And you're looking for alignment of people's personal purpose and the purpose that you have at work. And the more people are clear about what their purpose is, the easier it's going to be to create yeah. that alignment. Awesome. Super simple. I love it. Um, so you give a really great example with Adobe and kind of like recognizing that the cloud was going to be valuable. Um, so do you have any more insight potentially into how exactly they were able to make that recognition, maybe to give entrepreneurs an idea of the kind of research they could do to tap into those untapped uh, markets or segments? Yeah, they have one of those, those, those monumental strategic offsites back in 2010 in the mm -hmm. midst of you know, the, the turmoil from the financial crisis fallout. And they said, you know, we're really vulnerable. We don't have recurring revenues. There was this cloud thing. Maybe we should take a look at this cloud thing. And everyone's like, going, no, it's going to be so hard. We don't want to do this. And I go, no, we really should take a look at this. Right. And so they started doing it in earnest with mm -hmm. a product manager from the creative cloud with the CFO. And so from the very beginning, they had this really tight alignment against the strategy of the company and this market facing view. So they okay. had lots of research, came up with a minimally viable product, tested it in Australia, uh, found that people loved this. Mm -hmm. And so because it's isolated, it's, Australia is a great place to test with these kinds of things. They brought it back into the US and it was met with a lot of turmoil. 50,000 customers signed a protest saying, go back. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and then basically the CFO was explaining, you know, we basically burned the boats. We're saying we're moving forward. We've burned the boats. We're never going back. Yeah. They were determined. They were aligned as an organization. Now they didn't do that until later on when they realized there was traction. So they had an exit just in okay, case yeah. they were wrong. Right. Uh, so they're hedging their bets for a little while, but then they said, we're never going to, to be, um, do revisions on the, uh, the perpetual product anymore. 
It's right. going to stay where it is. We'll continue to support it, but we're not going to do any revisions on it. And that's when people sign the protest. Like, no, we want this more. Right. Because, no, you really like it. You have to buy cloud. We yeah. burn the boats. Mm -hmm. That was gutsy. I think um, it's just really great that you pointed out how they tested that, um, created that minimum viable product and tested it because that's likely what gave them such great confidence from the start um, to kind of move forward with that and burn those boats. Um, so that's something that's kind of like a way of thinking that entrepreneurs can potentially take into their own research and product development, which is awesome. I will tell you, they still didn't know if it was hundred percent that it was going to work. Right. They were pretty sure it was going to, they had run all the numbers. And I, I remember, um, talking with the product lead, she goes, I remember the moment when I pushed the pay, pushed the button and launched the website for this page. It was nerve wracking. She goes, I oh, felt no. the entire weight of the organization on my shoulders. Like, it's I, just going to I, work. Yeah, I can only imagine. And the thing that really made it work is that the executive team, the top of the organization literally said, are we all in on this? There's no going back. Right. Once we do this, we have to be a hundred percent united. And people were telling me like, they never flinched. They never yep, said, I... well, maybe we should hedge it. No, no. They just said, this is the future of the company. We're hundred percent behind this. Let's go. Come on, yeah. everyone. Let's go. They never, never flinched. Yeah. They had that team alignment. It's amazing. Awesome. Well, we are just out of time, but before we closed out, I wanted to get one last key takeaway, something, you know, from this topic or just a personal piece of wisdom that you carry with you, what would you want to leave with the audience? You have to do this every single day. You have to move out of your comfort zone every single day. And I know you as entrepreneurs already know this and your experience because you just embarked on this huge adventure of being an entrepreneur, right. uh, but do this every day and make sure you have the support network around you other entrepreneurs, people like entrepreneurs organization, NASDAQ, forums, whatever, and have those places where you can truly feel safe to share what's really going on. Because your mental well-being in dealing with discomfort, uh, being out of that comfort zone is going to be so key to your success. Awesome. Charlene, thank you so much. You set just an incredible overview, so many actionable insights. Um, we are just so grateful for your time on behalf of the entire NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center and everyone in attendance today. Um, we are so thrilled to have you join us. Thank you for the opportunity. Awesome. And to our audience, we would love for you to join us again for our upcoming webinars. You can view them using the link that's going to be posted in the chat. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And we look forward to welcoming you back online with us soon.